been a witness of uh, Asia's economic rise, and in particular over the past decade or so in China. And in terms of the grander economic growth projector, uh, where do you see China fall on this whole uh, curve of uh, economic rise here? Well, uh, thanks very much, uh, Shirley, for, for having me on here. In terms of the what I see, you know, China, China has been an amazing ride. I've been here almost nine years, uh, and it, the, the economy is bit, twice as big as it was when I got here in 2012, which is hard to imagine. Um, the momentum continues to be really significant. And while the, the overall percentages aren't, you know, they're probably half of what they were when I first got here, you know, ha you know still four or 5%, which obviously isn't gonna happen in 2020, but I think four or five, sometimes even 6% um, growth on, on whether it is the 15, $16 trillion economy is still amazing. Um, and this place I see over the next 10 years absolutely in, in real GDP terms, becoming the world's largest economy. Um, certainly from a, a PPP perspective, uh, so purchasing power parity, it, 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 it became number one, you know, sometime in the 2012, 2015 timeframe. But in terms of absolute GDP, um, I, I see it continuing to grow for at least another 10 years. Um, and that's really, really exciting. And no matter, you know, obviously there's a lot of issues right now with the U.S. and the trade war and, and whatnot. But I think China is actually going to come out of this. You know, I, I think China is totally focused on the future and kind of the U.S. is making a bunch of noise over here. But it's just going to keep going forward. So with this booming economy, Paul, why are you leaving? Because overall, you've spent almost 30 years in Asia, like 18 in uh, Japan, nine right. in China, as you've just mentioned, about four in Australia. But you're packing your bags and going where? Tell us more about that. Your next well, I'm, I'm, I'm going back to the future. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm actually <laughs> headed, headed back to Japan. Um, and and uh, I'm very excited. I've, I've actually uh, found quite an interesting role. Uh, and I'm stepping back into the world of, of big companies and corporate and taking on a big position with a, an organization that I think will allow me to make some pretty significant contributions and impacts um, in Japan in particular, but because of Japan's, you've got this, the, the Japanese companies obviously are very global. They've got a huge presence in China and in Southeast Asia. Um, so I anticipate continuing my, my, my 30 odd year journey. I can't imagine probably ever leaving Asia, but, uh, from, from a work perspective, I imagine it going for at least another 10 to 20 years. Um, and, and so while I've, I've enjoyed so much being in China for the last nine years, um, an opportunity came up for me to maybe do something bigger. Um, in the sense of you know, what I've been doing, particularly the last five years has been small, small little projects in, in the realm of sustainability, in the realm of, of advisory work for, for some multinational companies, as well as also advising smaller companies. This new opportunity is kind of putting me back into the corporate world I came from. Um, and now with some entrepreneurial experience is gonna allow me to really, I think, make some big contributions with really large companies and move the needle, I hope, in, in the area of sustainability. Most people at least you know the young generation they're going the totally different direction they want to become self-made uh, entrepreneurs they want to mm. start their own businesses become independent really fully enjoy uh, yep. freedom of work right but not really join a big company corporation anymore uh, do you think that you can have and create a bigger impact if you join one of these uh, large corporates again I, I think I can because I've, you know, I spent a lot of time, I spent 25 years in corporate life and then I went entrepreneur in my late forties. Um, I have to say, I have very much enjoyed being an entrepreneur. I very much enjoy deciding which of the 24 hours in the day and the seven days in the week I get to work. <laughs> <laughs> For somebody who give up that freedom, we congratulate you. <laughs> I wanted to do a lot of things and the things that I wanted to do are, are really moving the needle on energy efficiency, moving the needle on sustainability, addressing the causes of climate change. And it takes actually really deep pockets if you're going to really have a big impact um, because this is such a big problem. 
And, and the people at the heart, you know, the organizations at the, at the heart of that problem are other really big organizations. Mm -hmm. So I'm hopeful that I will be not go insane, that I will continue some of the habits that I've now developed as an entrepreneur and bring those into the big company. And also because of my age, I'm probably not going to be so interested in playing company politics. I'm just want to going to get on with the job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, uh, well, you know, we'll, we'll certainly come back to your, uh, you know, entrepreneurship in China in a little bit. But I want to go back to uh, the Chinese economy for a second for you. Okay. Just, just based on what you said, you know, the world seems to be more and more increasingly polarized. Now, mm. you know, people who live in China, I'm talking about a lot of people like you who don't have a, a stake in the Chinese uh, politics or, you know, the right. Chinese hierarchy, I should say. Yeah. As you mentioned, I'm not a billionaire yet right so, so <laughs> we are all barely participants and witnesses of the rise of the chinese economy but yet uh, you see people like you from china who are extremely optimistic about chinese mm. economy and the future and then all, all of a sudden you see the rest of the world particularly from the oecd economies that are you know uh, you know um, that are very very pessimistic about you know mm. everything perhaps from the politics to the economic model and so forth they are um negative about the future. What do you say? There is no point of uh, reconciliation here, isn't it? What do you say to the, the other side of the people? Hey, you're I, I, can, I can only, you know, I, I, I can say, look, I've, I've been in this part of the world for three decades. I've actually lived in China, from their perspective, the belly of the beast, um, for the last 10 years. Um, most people's image of what China, the reality of what China is, is China of 20 or 30 years ago. Um, obviously, the, the, with Xi Jinping, he's, he's changed the direction a bit. He's re-centralized a lot of power decisions. Um, but I think the, 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 the story that people outside of the region are getting from the media, in, to the Western media in particular, is just wrong. Um, now, I don't, I don't say, I mean, I'm not saying that that you know, there aren't problems here. There's problems. There's problems everywhere. Um, some some things that China is, you know, I don't I don't agree with what they're doing in the South China Sea from from what they you know the, the military uh, potential issues that they've created there by taking over some of the islands and whatnot. Um, but I also you know this this idea of the evil communists is is just wrong. Um, you know, China, China probably cares more about per personal privacy law than any other place in the world. And, and, and that's my area of expertise. But, you know, I think you know, Google and, and Twitter and whatnot don't operate in China because they weren't willing to not access all the personal data from all the people in China. So that's why they're not here. <laughs> you know, they're, they're welcome to be here, but the way that their algorithms run and pull the data um, they decided, no, we don't want to comply with Chinese law. Um, so I think, you know, th there's that, um, there's, you know, the, the, the economy here really is just phenomenal. Um, the focus on science and technology is, I think, where the U.S. was in the 50s and 60s, uh, in, in particular, you know, the, the, in particular, the, the, the auto, whole automotive this new energy vehicle uh, sector, NEV sector, that is really China's uh, equivalent to America's moonshot in the 1960s. Mm. The focus that the country is putting on that um, through, through things like AI, through industrial IoT, through um, their industrialized data centers, um, the move to renewable power, these are all st key strategic areas that the, the Chinese government is supporting industry to develop as quickly as possible. Um, and it's, you know, they are, they are for-profit companies. They are employing tremendous numbers of people. Like most societies, they got, they were really dirty industries for a long time. And now China is becoming, I would say, a leader in, in the area of cleaning up its economy from a sustainability perspective. Obviously, still more things it can do. It needs to get off of the coal. What are some uh, of the things China doing? Let's uh, explain it a little bit. I'm sorry. What are some of the things you said China is a leader in this area? What are some of the things China have been doing in this area? 
Um, so, I, you know, there's still, there's definitely still a gap, a technology gap between China and, and the West, as it were, primarily the U.S. when it comes to AI. Um, but, a, you know, China is very, very quickly catching up. Um, I was actually just at a program yesterday with the, the AmSAM, uh, where we had uh, an automotive conference, um, and we were talking with the, one of the presentations was from the group AutoX, which is one of the great up-and-coming uh, autonomous vehicle platform providers, um, and you know, the, the, the depth of the data that's coming out of China as they create the AI algorithms is just so much more complex than what they're able to generate in the United States. And part of the reason is because you know, anyone who's been in a vehicle, a car in China knows it's a little crazy. You know, people jaywalk, um, scooters are everywhere, bicycles are everywhere. You have crazy people walking up the side of the bridge. You have street sweepers and with, with old, you know, brooms and all the thing. As they train their AIs on how to cope with so many variables, um, the, you know, even though they don't have the, say, the 20 million hours of experience or 20 million miles of experience like Waymo has, their experience is actually so much deeper because of all the variables that are coming in at once and it's allowing their AI algorithms to actually advance much more quickly. Mm. Um, so it's still not at parity, but very, very close. And probably, this is just my opinion, within the next year or two, there'll be parity in terms of the AI capabilities between the two countries. And clearly in this AI example as well, China holds, is the second largest holder of patents after the United States. And I think number, actually China took over the U.S. last December, if I'm not it? mistaken. In, in, in terms of maybe new in patents terms that have of been filed here. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. Um, so, so, I mean, you know, it's, it's there, it's happening. The other big exciting area for China is 5G. Mm -hmm. And China absolutely dominates in 5G because of the fact that, you know, the world agreed, and the United States may have been asleep at the wheel when this happened, but the world collectively agreed that 5G does not need to be reverse compatible. So it's the first time a new telecom you know, technology does not have to be compatible with the say, in this case, the 4G, the 3G, mm -hmm. the 2G and whatnot. What and that the UK means- definitely, the UK definitely is regressing because that they just banned uh, Huawei from its uh, 5G networks. Well, you know, with, with 5G, because the whole world agree that it's not re uh, reverse compatible, that means Anybody who owns the 5G IP owns it outright. And one of the reasons why China has been such a huge investor, and they've invested billions and billions of dollars in this, both the companies and the government, they have managed to put, you know, there, there, there's so many Chinese people involved in the various organizations that are setting these world standards because they stood up and said, yes, we volunteer to do this. You know, they don't, they own the IP. They own it outright, and they, so anything that they build in 5G, they don't have any exposure to having to be complying with any of the chips, any of the protocols previously that are held by Germany, by the United States, by Japan. Mm. Um, and this is such a key reason why China is moving so fast to commercialize it. And potentially one of the reasons why the U.S. keeps trying to put the muck up and you know, slow it down. Because they realize once that happens, the U.S. will lose control over a lot of the communication networks around the world, particularly if they do end up being from Chinese vendors. Yeah. So if you talk about Japan as well, when it comes to the 5G network, how is that country faring, Paul? So I'm not that familiar with what is happening um, with, with local 5G players in Japan. You However, will find out very soon, as soon as you touch ground. I will find out very soon, hopefully November. My mobile phone uh, signals are super slow. <laughs> <laughs> you might be back in China very soon, Paul. <laughs> I'll be it's watching possible. movies as often as before. <laughs> it's possible. It's possible. The amazing thing is, you know, in Japan, back in the, in the 90s, uh, they actually laid the world's most sophisticated uh, broadband network across the entire country. They had more, uh, you know, uh, fiber than any place else in the world, except for like the last hundred meters, and nobody could figure out how to actually connect it. And the amazing thing is, 
they have these great technology companies like the Sony's and the Hitachi's and, and the Toshiba's and Mitsubishi's and whatnot. They have this amazing infrastructure that the government actually put in the ground with, with and it, by far the biggest bandwidth of anywhere in the world at that point in time. And nobody knew so what, what to do. happened, Paul? What they happened in what, that case? Why did Japan not develop more quickly? And why is it lagging behind China, for example, now? Is it I politics, think, economics? I, I think it's a lack of imagination. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, is it not an innovative country enough, do you think? It's, you know, I, I've often said that uh, if Mr. Matsushita or Mr. Honda tried to start their company today, they probably wouldn't be allowed to do it. Now, that, that trend may be changing. The reason for that is just the, the, the Japanese are so set in their ways um, that they are, you know, very, very process oriented now. It's mm -hmm. really difficult for the large companies there to become innovative. Um, and, and an observation from some of the people I've recently been talking to as I prepare to go there to just kind of understand, so how have things really changed in the last nine years? I think in Japanese companies, a lot of senior management gets, gets a lot of the new, the new tech. They want to be involved in the, you know, the new AI. They want to be involved in, in the new 5G and what that's going to do to the businesses. Where things get stuck up in the big Japanese companies seems to be at what they call the bucho level, which is that middle management level, um, which are typically men um, in, in their you know, mid-40s, mid early to mid-40s, most typically, and they're just unwilling to take any risks where there might, you know, they might not have complete success. Um, and that's a huge difference between Japan and China. China seems to be, you know, we want to be the first. We'll take, we'll take risks to be the first. And uh, in Japan, it tends to be, well, who are the other three people that have done it? And if they've done it, then we'll look at it. And it's the exact opposite approach. <laughs> Very so as you are a leadership and management expert as well, Paul, how <laughs> would you approach the situation? What kind of advice would you give to really change this traditional a corporate structure and hierarchy. Hmm. Well, it, it really comes down, I mean, you're talking about changing some of the fundamentals of the Japanese culture. Um, and maybe COVID-19 will, will, will be the modern version of the black ships. Mm -hmm. um, in what is 1853 rocking up in Yokohama Harbor, which turned their world upside down. That was the beginning of the modernization of Japan. Um, you know, maybe COVID has been such a shock to the system that they will start to allow more innovation and actually push for more innovation to start happening. Somehow, they need to create a culture in these big companies for that middle management to accept and not be penalized for taking risks and failing. And it is, it is a huge problem in China that generally failure you know, is stereotypically for sure, but you know, failure is generally not accepted. You know, if you fail, then you have to go back. You, 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 you know, you're banished to, to the desert or something. Mm -hmm. um, in China, failure, similar to what, what the entrepreneurial spirit is like in the U.S., particularly Silicon Valley, you know, you, you, you're, not, you're not considered to be trustworthy until you've failed at least three or four times. Then they think you're probably ready to really do something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so how, how, how to create a culture in that really hierarchical Japanese environment that will allow people to be comfortable to you know, make mistakes and, and fail, because that's how you learn. So Paul, uh, environmental sustainability. Mm. China has, uh, a few years back, uh, if uh, you know, expats have left to China, they complained about pollution. You living in Beijing, it was, uh, right. some days, it was a nightmare, right? Waking up. Air apocalypse, huh? It's improved a lot. And I think it's people mass. all over the world, I mean, it looks, it looks like they, they won't believe it. <laughs> they say, well, just perhaps I'll be faking it. But in actuality, do you have some numbers to show what China has been doing in the environmental, in anti-pollution area spe uh, specifically? Right. Um, I mean, obviously the PPM, just, I mean, the, the background photo, this is actually taken with my iPhone about nine months ago. <laughs> That's a real photo. It's not Photoshopped. <laughs> um, and, and nine years ago, eight years ago, right when I was first coming is, is, in China, that's when we were experiencing the air apocalypse. And that's when, you know, the, the, we were getting up to 500 ppm, you know, every day for weeks on end. 
And the reason it was only 500 ppm, because that's how high the machine would go. Probably in reality, it was more like 1200 or 1600. <laughs> it, was, it was bad. <laughs> There's no question. And, and at that point in time, you may recall, I mean, a lot of the schools were building air bubbles over their, their right. fields so the kids could play. Yeah. Um, you know, you don't, you don't ride your bicycle. You're always wearing a mask. Um, that's worked out quite, quite well for us in COVID-19. We all have a culture exactly. now. Exactly. <laughs> it's just like in Beijing during an apocalypse. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I mean, the number of days that we are having, and I think actually Beijing's air may have actually improved a little bit more than what Shanghai's air has improved. But both places are now, you know, it's, it's pretty rare now when we've got a day that's over 200 ppm, which is still not great. I appreciate that compared yeah. to where we were coming from. Um, it's a huge improvement. And I'd say most days on average, even, even in the winter, we're probably in the anywhere from 40 to 70 ppm. Now this is anecdotally. I don't. I don't have the actual right. data, but it just is, looking at my looking at my apps, that's kind of what we're seeing, which right. is still higher than typically what you get in an LA or a Tokyo or a London. But sure. it's it's you know it's actually fine. It's now okay. So visibly, we can all see the air difference. But what what exactly has been done in terms of of how, well, I mean, how, how have how, they done it? How come the improvements? Where did it come right. from? Right. Closing the coal think, factories, limiting number plates, the traffic. There, there's been a, yeah, there's been a few things. One is, and this is still probably a, a bit minimal, but now almost 4% of all vehicles in China are now electric vehicles. Um, and that is growing. Um, that you know, the, the government has an objective to grow that to 25% by 2025. Um, one of the people at the conference I was at yesterday, which is from a very large U.S. Uh, finance house, they actually believe they actually believe it'll be closer to 40% of all vehicles in China will be electric by then. That's a huge step up. I don't know if that's going to come, but that is clearly you know that's having some impact. Certainly, all the public transportation now all the buses are going electric. Almost all the buses in Shanghai and Shenzhen are electric. Um, a lot of a lot of industry has also been moved out of the big cities. So you might say that's a bit of cheating. China's environmental laws were massively strengthened over the last 36 months, um, and and who enforces those laws was changed. It's no longer your local uh, party guy uh, who's coming to do the inspection, who who has the potential to be potentially persuaded. Let's say to give somebody a passing mark, even if they're not passing. The new regulations are that the inspectors come from a city that is, you know, they completely different city from the other side of the country. Um, and they come with real teeth now. So they come with the tax office and the penalties are real. Um, and, and, you know, it's 100,000, 200,000, 500,000 daily fines of people are not in compliance now. And those wow. laws were on the book before, but they weren't being enforced the way they're being enforced now. And they are absolutely very strictly being enforced. I've had some clients- It's serious business now. Serious business. They're, you know, they're tracking the VOCs. They've got the monitor stations in the chemical uh, industrial parks. Um, and there are serious fines. And because it's China, you know, when they say they're gonna put you in jail, they put you in jail. <laughs> there's there's really nothing nothing more that you can get you off. <laughs> so, so you're talking about Paul. Basically, the government has really uh, used the policies to restrict, uh, uh, you know, pollutants uh, in the, the that damages the environment. But uh, from my understanding, you know, say for me as an average consumer, if I go right. out and shop for a car now again, you know, I would still go for my. I wouldn't go for an EV. I would still go for my old style Mercedes. Now, you know, get an electric Mercedes. In a couple of years, you won't have a choice. Right. But the, <laughs> but the, but the thing is that but you know, you know what's, what's interesting. Well, the thing is that for me, as a consumer, how do you convince ah. me, or you know, if you enlarge me to forty percent of potentially Chinese population, okay. how do you convince so, me to convert to a? Are EV there incentives or? and enough incentives? There, there are incentives, but the incentives have been cut back. Um, so they, they peaked last year in 2019, and there was, there was a big buildup, and right after, as the incentives were about to disappear, then they disappeared. And then, and then the EV numbers started to fall off a bit. Um, 
they've they've brought some of the incentives back now during COVID. Um, so the the NEVs are still not back. I mean, they're about ninety percent where they were before in terms of the sales numbers of, of passenger vehicles. Um, but the amazing thing is, and this is where I I will surely I will kind of push back on you and say. I think, you know, it, you may still want to go spend $80,000 on a gasoline-powered Mercedes, but there seem to be about 15,000 Chinese people a month right now willing to spend $80,000 on a Tesla. Um, because for the last three months, that's how many Teslas they've sold every month. Because and I would argue as a woman, because it looks better sometimes. <laughs> it is no, but surely, you know, a fancy Tesla and very soon, you know, a self-driving vehicle, you don't but, uh, have to do anything anymore. They're coming. They're coming uh, I, for I sure. I get your point. And, I get your point. And, 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 and the, the price parity is, is absolutely getting there. Right now, gasoline prices are lower than they have been for a long time because right. nobody's buying gasoline. But... China, China is also going to regulate out internal combustion engines, uh, cars. So they still haven't picked a date, but the industry is, is you know, the, the buzz in the industry is by 2030, you will no longer be able to sell an internal combustion engine car in China. Mm -hmm. They will regulate them out of existence. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also, it's really interesting. One of the reasons, you know, the automotive sector in China is having a V-shaped recovery. Um, at, at, at a total number. So passenger vehicles have still not fully recovered. They're about 90% of where they were. Commercial vehicles are running at 200%. Commercial vehicles are on track to have their best year ever. Um, over, over, you know, the right now, if they can maintain the pace they had in the first half of the year, they'll sell about 5.3 million commercial vehicles in China this year, which is, you know, they sold 4.2 million last year. They sold 4.3 million the year before that. Um, it's just a huge, huge number. And one of the reasons is the incentives that the government has been putting out there um, is for, particularly for industry, to replace all their existing trucks with super efficient um, uh, new vehicles. The, they can be either electric or gasoline powered, but the gasoline powered have to have a very, very high efficiency level. So they must be getting you know, 30, 40 uh, kilometers to the liter or, or whatever the standards are. They're very, very high. So the government, the government is going to mandate this to happen. The other thing, and I don't, you, know, you can't always trust consumer surveys, but 65% of Chinese people claim that the next vehicle they're going to buy will be is going to be an electric vehicle. And you know, people only own cars in China for three to four years before they upgrade. It seems to be the trend. Right. So that means there's there's going to be and there's and there's all kinds of new models. There's, there's one, there's a consolidation happening in the industry in China. There's 500 EV makers in China. I think in two years, there'll be four. <laughs> so let me, uh, let me follow up on this uh, Tesla. It just okay. sold its uh, giant factory in Shanghai, and it's uh, right. scheduled, uh, from what my understanding, is going to launch world's very first new model out of Shanghai. And so that is seen sort of like a global innovation center by Elon Musk, uh, mm. the next generation of Tesla. In this whole uh, global geopolitical debate, you know, uh, the campaign message for the RNC is that we're going to pull a million jobs uh, back from China to the United States. And yet uh, this uh, staunch supporter, I should say, of uh, President Trump, Elon Musk, it's, it's uh, you know, banking on China's future, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, I mean, he's, he's, uh, he, he's, he's got such a unique situation here as well. He's the first car company to be able to come into China completely on his own. He's the first one not to be a joint venture. So he owns it outright. Incredibly unusual. But it also shows you the pragmatism of the Chinese government, um, that they wanted that tech in China. They want, they've got a huge focus on EVs. They, want to find, you know, they wanted to find somebody who would take it to go beyond just fleet buyers. So, so far, all the electric vehicles, the majority of electric vehicles, passenger vehicles that have been sold in China have been sold to fleets like Didi. Tesla is selling all their cars to individuals. They're not selling them to fleets. Um, and, and, and this is part of China's, you know, again, their strategy of they want to be number one in AI. They want to be number one in connectivity. They want to be number one in 5G. Number the one Tesla in everything. Product, the Tesla product is absolutely in the sweet spot to drive all of that. And the way that Tesla does their product development, they're not a car company. They're an IT company that happens to make cars. And that's a really important distinction. <laughs> and that mentality of quickly reiterate, quickly change, 
send updates to the car software you know, over the you know 5G networks um, to get better efficiencies. That's exactly the same way China thinks. China wanted that to be here, so I think you know they were like, you, you what, they don't care what country. There's actually Chinese government doesn't really care what country the technology comes from. They want to be the user. If if the U.S. continues to push its agenda of cutting China off from the tech, China's just going to develop their own, and that's already happening. I mean, there, there's huge initiatives right now for China to build its own IC chips, to build all of its own uh, software. It's got a huge, huge gap. Now, it's got a couple of years of serious pain, I think, because of that. But in 2025, you're going to see Chinese tech that's as good, if not better, and probably much cheaper than what's coming out of the U.S. and Europe. Particularly in manufacturing. So goes that maybe. Speaking, in man, well, also, but also semicon. And and connectivity technology and I mean they're just they're just pulling all of this stuff. I, I mean who the hell have all the PhDs that have been going to these programs in America been for the last two, ten years? Like fifty percent of them are Chinese people. And if they're and not the turtles, well, right? America, they, they all go back back. to China. Well, Paul, we yeah. could go on with this for hours, yeah. but uh, we're already short of time. Uh, you know, a little, little while. So I want to talk about water, um, China had a uh, water shortage, you know, historically. And so yeah. um, right now, you know, with more pollution, perhaps, uh, you, even with agriculture, you know, water has always been, uh, I think, uh, a major uh, environmental security, but even national security issue. What has been done? Mm. Sorry, the question? What has been done there? What has been done um, in the water area? Right. I'm I'm not as familiar with the water. Um, you know, in some respects, yes, China China definitely has, particularly in its main farming regions up in the northeast and the northwest. There's a huge issue because the aquifers are, are dropping really quickly. Um, thanks to climate change, having water is not going to be much of a problem for too long. <laughs> not having water, we're going to have a lot of water really soon. It's not going to be in the right places. Like what you know, we've been seeing this year along the Yangtze River. Um, we've just had massive, massive floods this year. I don't know if the world is really aware of it. Certainly yeah. within China, um, you know, this is actually bigger, almost bigger news than COVID on mm -hmm. the floods that we've had this year. Um, you know, China built the Three Gorges Dam. It's really being tested right now. I mean, this week, you know, the, one of the reasons for building Three Gorges Dam was to control the flooding on the Yangtze. We're having like the fifth major series of floods this year. <laughs> potentially because of the Yangtze. But because of that, Shanghai and Nanjing are not flooding. So thank you. <laughs> but, uh, you know. We can and have to expect uh, more extreme weather events for sure. No Flooding and locust no invasions. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and you know, it's interesting. I, I was at a presentation a couple of years ago with a, a Richard Brubaker, who's, who runs a, another, his own sustainability business here. And he made a really interesting observation. One of the reasons why China has been such a big importer of soybeans um, is it takes a lot of water to grow soybeans. And he kind of flipped the whole equation on its head of China is importing so many soybeans from America. In reality, what they're importing is like 50 trillion liters of water. Yeah. You know, and it happens to come in the form of a soybean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because yeah. there's, not a, there's not enough water left in the aquifers in China to, to grow enough soybeans. And it's really interesting when you think about that problem, why did they buy the billions of pounds of, of soybeans? It's because they want the water. And, that's and that's it, very interesting. I, I've always said uh, that uh, US-China phase one trade deal comes with a lot of benefits for China because it is the actual yeah. most strategic interest to buy agriculture. Imagine Absolutely. if US one day sa sa says that um, we're not gonna sell China any agriculture anymore. I think that'll be a big problem. That would be a huge problem because who else? Nobody can buy the volume of agriculture that China will buy. Um, well, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's so insane. The market that supplies China as well. Yeah, it's so insane when the politicians get into business. I mean, it just creates so much problems. So I know the questions about water. <laughs> but let's but, not talk about politics, Paul. Okay. So, so uh, on the China, I think the world it doesn't yet talk about this a lot and i know even china them uh, you know chinese people themselves they don't talk about it a lot china is no. actually the largest investor in global clean energy yes china has sure. been there for a couple of years now 
what is China investing in globally? Well, I think most of the most of China's global vision seems to be anchored around Xi Jinping's Belt Road Initiative, right? Um, and so, <clears throat> unfortunately, in my opinion, they're still building some coal-fired power plants along the new Belt Road, um, but they're also putting in a lot of solar. They're putting in a lot of, of uh, wind. Um, and you know, there's, you know, ten years ago, there were a number of different places around the world you go to get that hardware. The only place you can really get it now is from China. Um, and even, even Siemens and, and all the big manufacturers of this equipment, a lot of them are actually manufacturing that equipment in China. Um, and so the know-how on, on these systems is sitting in China. The, uh, the, the volumes now have to be, because the prices have gotten so low, the volumes have to be so big in order for, particularly in the realm of solar, for these guys to make any money. Um, that they are always on the hunt now for the next 50 megawatt you know, solar power plant, and they'll go anywhere in the world to get it. Most, most of the solar companies that I'm aware of are actually much more active. Chinese solar companies are much more active outside of China than in China right now um, because you know, they, did, they just can't cope with the pricing pressure in China either. But, but the, the real opportunity for them is to take this tech that's been developed in China um, and refined. Originally, a lot of it came from offshore, and it's all been refined here, and that is sent it back out. So, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, and, and the fuel cell also technology is another area where China is uh, primarily from a mobility perspective um, and doing what China does, right? I mean, they, the, the Japanese, Toyota made an agreement about 12 months ago that they're going to share their fuel cell technology with the Chinese automotive uh, sector. Um, and they've set up a new R&D center here in China. Um, and it's, it's, it's a win-win situation because Toyota's invested billions and many years in fuel cells and haven't been able to get it to commercialize appropriately. They have vehicles. They have plenty of vehicles that can run on you know, that are commercially manufactured, but they just haven't been able to get enough consumer interest. Um, so I think by bringing China into the fold with the way that they've done is very clever um, because China sees, I think, battery technology as a stepping stone um, because battery technology still creates a lot of waste. The way they, you know, what, what you have to do to manufacture the minerals and, and materials you need to manufacture battery, you still have the battery after 20 years, what do you do with it? Um, and I, I think the, the, the end game for China when it comes particularly to mobility is to get into fuel cells. And I think they're going to, you're going to see more and more fuel cell technology for new energy vehicles. Um, and that's something that China will hopefully, also, you know, as, they, as they get more comfortable with it, will also start exporting them.